Hi, this is Kurt Robbins with Higher Learning LV in Las Vegas, and welcome back to season two of Kurt's Cannabis Corner. This week, we have a very special guest, Dr. Nicholas Schleens, and he's the new research director at Realm of Caring. But the real reason we have him here to talk is because he has a very recent research study that has been published, and it talks about CBD for epilepsy. So welcome, Dr. Schleens. Thank you, Kurt. Um, really great to be here and just I did some like, background research on you beforehand, and I love the learning platform that you have been developing. I think it's oh, fantastic for a number of reasons. CBD is obviously a hyper popular molecule, and there's both good and bad to that for patients and people seeking true wellness relief. But you've recently, in July, released a research study that talks about both the pros and the cons and some of the misperceptions of CBD for epilepsy. Can you kind of lead us into that? So this study was basically born out of the fact that when we started collecting this, this data, and, and this is when, you know, more and more states were pa you know, passing legislation for CBD and medical cannabis, you know, more and more products began to, you know, hit the retail marketplace, but we really had no sense of what people were using, how often they were using it, what conditions they had, or even what doses. Right. So that was, you know, an intriguing question by itself. And then it becomes even more complex when you think about how a lot of healthcare providers at the time really were just deep in the woods and didn't have a lot of information. That was really kind of, you know, the main impetus for us going after the study. In terms of like the science, Kurt, like the standard way that, you know, drugs are developed are through these randomized clinical trials or controlled trials. You know, they recruit people that have very few medical conditions, so really in great health, taking very few medications. And they compare how they respond to a new drug compared to a placebo group that doesn't receive active drug. Called the control group, correct? Yep, exactly. Now, the nice thing about that is that it's really rigorous and it reduces you know, potential outside confounds that could complicate why we think it's working or not working. Given the current illicit status still of many things at the federal level, we can't do those. And even with trials like Epidiolex, pharmaceutical grade CBD, they aren't doing many of them and not every person or condition can get into those studies. You know, one of the first main goals of our, of our survey was, let's see what people are using and, and see where that takes us. You know, we tracked important outcome variables. So quality of life, anxiety symptoms, depression symptoms, adult right. sleep, child I, sleep. And didn't the study report that anxiety levels decreased, depression levels decreased, and mm -hmm. that sometimes insomnia was abated somewhat. So it was exactly. somewhat of a sleep aid. Yeah. So those are like all, you know, fantastic findings. Right. The one thing that was interesting was that for our study, we didn't see any significant reductions in seizures. But as we dug a little bit deeper into our two groups, we found that both groups had their seizures pretty well controlled in the first place. So that, we reason, limited how much movement you, you would actually see in terms of improvement with the seizures. Right. And if the car's average, already going 60 miles an hour, how do you record a zero to 60 improvement time? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And even in terms of, you know, seizure frequency, they were very, very low. Um, rather than be kind of bummed out that oh, we're not seeing any signal and looked at, the, you know, the bigger picture, you know, the majority of individuals with epilepsy and, and seizure disorders have a number of comorbid conditions, Right. you know, anxiety, depression sometimes behavioral disorders or developmental disorders. I was formerly trained as a clinical psychologist, so I completely understand the quality of life because it's kind of like the foundation for your day and, and right. how you pursue things. In, in that study, seeing you know how the CBD led to significant improvements in those quality of life variables, I don't think they get lost in the shadow of a null finding about nothing really happening to seizures. Nowadays, we talk about integrating CBD into standard epilepsy and seizure disorder treatments. And if that can improve quality of life and reduce anxiety and depression, then I think that's a great thing. Because I but, see anxiety and depression leading to other problems and just generally degrading the patient's ability to deal with the disease state in the first place. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I think 
it's just like one of those like vicious cycles where right. you know you, you might have improvement with traditional anti-epileptic meds but if you're down there you know if you're having kind of an off day and your mood's kind of tanking and you're feeling anxious as a child that could easily manifest any number of ways as an adult could be an argument a really bad day at the job i think it really plays a, a, a pivotal role in how we how we cope with things and as we both know many other research studies both clinical trials and not have revealed alleviation of anxiety and depression from phytomolecules like cbd or thc you know, dosing becomes critical as we all know it's deep science it's very complicated yeah. and subjective efficacy makes it so complicated for researchers like you i feel for you everybody's different and their biochemistry varies so much and you're looking for standards and background mechanisms that might lead to a reduction in seizure occurrence because that's a good thing for everybody. And I appreciate you acknowledging kind of those challenges. When I first began my postdoctoral training at Johns Hopkins in cannabis, I didn't have any cannabis research prior to that. It was strictly nicotine and tobacco. I think for a change, I had to like be like a passing vision, like, no, let's get some different training. I think the landscape is changing and lo and behold, it began to change. So I'm glad that right. I made that decision. What I thought would be not a lot to learn or to catch up on was actually pretty daunting. Um, not just the, the plant itself and the mysteries that it still holds, but just our own endocannabinoid system is, is fascinating. And, you know, who knows where we'll be in five years with, with what we know about that and different therapeutic you know, implications. Right. It's just, un, it's unbelievable. As an instructional designer, I find it very enticing because there's so many layers and yeah. you can build a whole curriculum around just small elements of this plant and its medicinal efficacy for humans. You know, sometimes it, it's tough for me and in, in my role as research director, you know, I have all of that scientific training and then I have all of the clinical training too. You know, yeah. you know, my colleagues get really excited about developments in the field. And a lot of times, Kurt, I mean, you've seen this, it doesn't start out in a human laboratory. It starts out in these preclinical studies with rodents. So we might, see, we might see developments for one aspect of like a minor cannabinoid yeah. in a rat, but it becomes really easy to want to generalize that quickly to, to humans right. when I, the obstacles for research are less abundant. Like um, schedule one, for example, you're right. Yeah, first and foremost, that we can you know, hopefully make up for the decades that we're just in limbo. I note in one of my courses that I think it's ironic that we discovered phytocannabinoids nearly a century prior to the discovery of the entire endocannabinoid system, which didn't even occur until the early 1990s within yeah. many of our lives. So I hear your message of making up for lost time because I, yeah. as soon as we can get true research going on with real medicine, not just the University of Mississippi product, right. it's fun to see researchers like you show so much passion for what we don't know yet. I think my passion kind of developed when I was doing a clinical residency in Massachusetts at the Bedford VA. And as the addictions intern, Kurt, I had a lot of veterans that I was doing exposure therapies with for, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder. And these mm -hmm. were guys and gals that were returning from you know, Iraq and Afghanistan and just if you could imagine it, it was just, you know, very traumatized. Yeah, to see. And when I would go into their charts, just to make notes of, of their progress, you would see these like really long lists of medications that they would take on a daily basis. And I have no, no strong stance in medications, but I also don't know what it's like to be on a dozen or more medications and what that does to any number of you know, basic you know, bodily processes or how it makes one feel or how we're lying and makes you feel on those. Right. So if I can help out in that process with research that the government uses or other policymakers use or refer to, to um, lax the laws, and then, then I've done my job. Nice. Let's talk a little about Realm of Caring. It's yeah. a very well-respected organization, so congratulations on your new position. And I think your appointment to this position is a real rubber-meets-the-road example of the mm -hmm. true commitment of certain organizations in the United States to further research to solve this mystery. Um, I first met one of our co-founders, Heather Jackson. I think going back to 2016, Kurt, when we had this idea 
of this uh, research registry, it was myself, Heather, and my mentor at Hopkins, Ryan Vandre, and then it was Marcel von Miller. And it started you know, to really gain traction. I remember that day because Heather was telling me about why this was so important to her. I had a little hint of why that was, but she really discussed how you know, her son, Zakai, had a really rare seizure disorder and the medications would just do a number on him. And there really was no quality of life. So when they began uh, you know, a treatment regimen of CBD, it's like the skies opened up and the sun began shining. And she, you know, I think she told me something to the extent you know, on the streets of Montreal, when you see something that works and you know all these other families are suffering, you just want to go to the mountaintops and just scream out what you found. And that keeps me motivated for a number of reasons, but I'm glad that they, you know, brought me on board. You know, I helped develop this registry. Which Let's is- talk more about that registry because yeah. when I was doing the research for this, that really caught my attention because it seems very unique. I won't say that clinical trials are are always ideal. In many cases, they are. But this survey was really designed to cast kind of a broad net over what people are using in their natural environments, not in a strict dosing regimen in a laboratory somewhere. So we built it to cover the range of products that we knew were popular on the market, including just basic generic plant material or oils or edibles. So you're taking a certain approach of what is real world, what is actually being used in the wild. Yep. And that, and that was important because when we first launched this in 2016, it's a pretty lengthy survey. We invite people to take it every three months to get that you know, potential effect of not only time, but also if they are using a CBD product, you know, what's that doing to any of these health variables? Anxiety, mood, sleep pain when for our current one Kurt, we're doing it for about two years so even though we designed this this latest one to be as seamless as possible i think our first version really succeeded because we would have our specialist at that dog on the caring call people periodically it sounds like you're trying to integrate community and that certainly is a good thing i know there's been a lot of talk about community marketing and and different aspects of inclusion One of the major goals of Ryan with Karen too is to also educate the community, be involved in the community, you know, like you're doing with your education platform, Kurt, legitimize the use of these products, but also provide guidelines and education because there's still a lot of mistaken beliefs out there. And even even on the basic labels or instruction labels for these products, they don't always tell you the full story. Um, If we can go out there and correct that and potentially help someone's use lead to symptom relief, then that's awesome. One one message I'm trying to get through in some of my instructional design is dosing. It's Mm -hmm. not good enough to just say, hey, take some CBD, your arthritis will feel better. It's like, we all wish it was that simple. And learning about some of these biphasic response curves, like with THC, where a low or reasonable dose, again, very subjective, will lower anxiety, but a, say, triple or quadruple dose, especially if it's a novice consumer, could send them into a panic attack. And there are reports mm-hmm. from ERs across the country uh, every week of people who got too much THC in their system. So I think that's something that I'm really excited that some wellness professionals and folks like yourself are starting to understand is we can't make generalized rules like THC is good for or bad for anxiety. It really depends on a lot of factors. Yeah. I mean, like you said, like, you know, really tailing it to the individual, knowing like their, their background, a sexually dimorphic endocannabinoid system, how there's weight differences that can affect it. They're all so many important factors to really take into consideration. And mm-hmm. Charlotte Swab is doing you know great things um, right. with their dose, with their dose, and where they actually have little markers on what's the name? Oh, I'm the graduated blanking. eyedroppers. Yep, yep. So I think that's that's a, a great first start. So people are not underdosing exactly. or, over, or overdosing. An eyedropper that's not graduated. It's like spend the extra two pennies and please yeah. help patients dose correctly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, to anyone else, they might seem like, wow, that's kind of underwhelming, but <laughs> I, I wouldn't be surprised if it makes a, a huge difference. I, I would hope it would. Well, your registry is now about half a decade old, right? So I'm guessing it's given you a lot of opportunity to fine tune the model and you're really getting into a zone that's probably putting a smile on your face. And we're currently working on just getting a paper out on dosing. From our, our first batch of data, we had 
you know, over a little over a hundred unique medical conditions. You know, as you could imagine, the dosing was all over the place. And a standard practice that we use at Realm of Caring is that they will tell clients to start low and go slow. And we see evidence of that in our data. But as you mentioned, for things like chronic pain and arthritis, people are often impatient rather than kind of to stay the course like a number of medications. So, but yeah, you see a lot of different patterns and you see, you know, dosages that can be higher, for example, for cancer, given that it's like a, you know, kind of throw the kitchen sink at it just to get everything going or neurological disorders. Whereas you might see smaller doses for sleep or, you know, even chronic pain. Let's talk about the future. Yeah. Realm of Caring is, in my opinion, a very successful organization, very well respected within the professional community. It's exciting to see the two of you working together. What can we expect in the future? With new products and, and then the combination of, of our, you know, our advisory board, you know, that includes some you know, really great cannabis minds. I think really hammering home dosing is a priority for us. I think the regulatory piece will always be fascinating and, and looking at that by by state and as laws change in terms of like quantity. But I think for the time being, you know, our goal is to really build up this registry to the best of our abilities. The more people we have, the more conditions we can have be represented. As a psychologist, I like that because whenever you're going through something and you don't think there's anyone really out there that's experiencing what you're experiencing, but then you happen to actually meet someone um, that's going through it, it's, it's so, it feels good. It's so cathartic. Right. So I, I think when we have data for each person that calls up and we can actually let them know that they're not alone, you know, I think it's a beautiful thing. I try to tell readers and students that all data, if it's valid, if it's collected in a scientifically valid manner, is good, whether it's from a test tube, a rodent, or a human clinical trial involving hundreds of people around the world, possibly, and costing millions of dollars. But it's all valid data that kind of fits into the puzzle of understanding. It's really simple. This, this person has uh, cancer or chronic pain or inflammation, and they're simply seeking relief. Can we deliver that with the molecules in this plant? Mm -hmm. You know, I love how you put that. You know, it sounds like you get aspects. to see the, the theory and the reality, the theory yeah. being kind of an academic or research context, the reality being the clinical role and talking to real patients seeking real mm -hmm. relief. It's, it's, yeah. it's powerful um, being in both. As, as much as I love academic theory, and it's a really big chunk of what I've done my entire career, if we get mired and trapped in that theory, we lose sight of the end goal. Every tower of academics can be so out of touch with the community and the people that are in need, you know, and I think there's tremendous potential too with cannabis and cannabinoids with addiction, but yeah, I think we've got a ways to go, but I'm excited. It is exciting. And, uh, Many of us in the industry are familiar with Realm of Caring and Charlotte's Web. Uh, Great reputations. They've built a network of fans and supporters and stakeholders. I'm just really excited to see what comes out of this partnership, if you will, and your new yeah. role as research director over the next few years. Yeah, I am too. And I, I thank you for your kind words. Yeah. Kurt. Everything changes so fast with cannabis. So you kind of have to just you know, keep your finger on the pulse. We've got great staff, you know, we've got great you know, sponsors and collaborators at, at CW. Those things alone can just take us a long way. Thanks for tuning in to Kurt's Cannabis Corner this week, where our guest was Dr. Nicholas Schleens, the new research director for Realm of Caring. We want to show our thanks to Grasslands, Realm of Caring, and especially Dr. Schleens for his time and expertise. Thanks, Dr. Schleens. Thanks, Kurt.